Saturday Night Theatre. We present Dennis Price in Kind Hearts and Coronets, a radio version of the Ealing Studios film which was based on a novel by Roy Horniman. The screenplay by Robert Hamer and John Dighton has been adapted by Gilbert Travers Thomas. Kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood. Kind hearts and coronets. The sentence of the law passed upon Louis Dasgoyne Mazzini, Duke of Chalfont, found guilty of murder, will be carried into execution at 8 a.m. tomorrow. A Duke, eh? Wow. Good evening, Mr. Elliot. Good evening, Warder. Nice drop of rain? Uh, yes. Oh, uh, just sign the book, if you will. Oh, thank you. Been keeping you busy, Mr. Elliot? Oh, uh, just nicely, you know. We up to Manchester on Monday, a poisoner. Baby farmer had died away this morning. Very ordinary cries, both of them. Oh, well, this one we've got for you tomorrow is something special. Oh, uh, yes, very much so. Even after all my years in the profession, I'm quite looking forward to him. Well, I must be getting along. Uh, is the governor in? Yes, he's expecting you. Oh, well, uh, good night. Good night, Mr. Elliot. Oh, uh, usual cup of tea at seven? Oh, please, yes. Well, Elliot, this is a very terrible occasion. It is indeed, sir. Even my late lamented master, the great Mr. Berry himself, never had the privilege of hanging a duke. Uh, quite, right. <sighs> what a finale to a lifetime in the public service. Finale? Yes, I intend to retire after using the silken rope, never again be content with him. Quite. Do you wish to have a look at the duke? Uh, well, uh, just a glimpse, an idea of size and weight, you know. Um, how do you think you'll approach it? I should think as the calmest you've ever known. Uh, noblesse oblige, doubtless. Difficult client can make things most distressing. Quite. Oh, well, I uh, almost forgot, um, you must forgive my ignorance, but uh, when I meet the Duke in the morning, what is the correct form of address, uh, Your Lordship? Your Grace. Your Grace? Uh, oh, well, thank you. Good morning, Your Grace. Good morning, Your Grace. Good morning, Your Grace. Good evening, Your Grace. Ah, good evening, Colonel. Uh, will you have a glass of wine? Uh, thank you, no. I, uh, I called to inquire whether you had any special wishes for breakfast. Oh, just coffee and a slice of toast, thank you. Oh, and uh, perhaps a few grapes. Grapes. I hate to disappoint the newspaper reading public, but it'll be too early for the conventional hearty breakfast. The appointment is at eight, is it not? At eight. Yes. If I may venture to say so, I'm amazed at your calmness. Dr. Johnson was, um, as always, right when he observed, uh, depend upon it, sir, when a man knows that he's going to be hanged in a few hours, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. Yes. If there's nothing further I can do for you... Oh, nothing, thank you, Colonel. Uh, unless... Your uh, grace? Well, this quill, it scratches abominably as I write. Of course. I'll have another sent down to my office. Thank you. We shall have the opportunity of making our adieus in the morning, I presume? I regret to say, yes. Good night, Your Grace. Good night, Colonel. <sighs> A brief history of the events, leading thereto, written on the eve of his execution by Louis d'Ascarne Mazzini, 10th Duke of Chalfont, who, who ventures to hope that this confession of his guilt may prove not uninteresting to those who remain to read it. With so little time remaining to complete my story, it's difficult to choose where to begin it. Perhaps I shall begin at the beginning. My mother was the daughter of the 7th Duke of Chalfont. As soon as she was of age, 
she eloped with a handsome Italian singer called Mazzini, who succumbed to a heart attack at the moment of first setting eyes on me. <sighs> Thus early in his career, Papa was sent to join the heavenly choir. Reduced to penury by my father's death, Mama swallowed her pride and made an effort of reconciliation with her family. They did not even reply to her letter. So, in order to keep us both alive, she was reduced to the horrible expedient of taking a lodger. And this is the sitting room, Mr. Perkins. Oh. <laughs> yes, it's a nice little place you've got here. Uh, well, Mrs., uh, I think we might come to some arrangement. Uh, say, uh... Um... Twenty-five shillings a week. Thus, protected by Mama's small annuity and the weekly contributions of Mr. Perkins, I passed from infancy to childhood in an atmosphere of family, history and genealogies until I knew the descent of the House of Chalfont by heart. The dukedom had been bestowed by Charles II on Colonel Henry Dascoyne, for services rendered to his majesty during his exile. Sire! Later, for services rendered to his majesty after his restoration by the Duchess... Oh, sire! <clears throat> the title was granted the unique privilege of descending by the female as well as the male line. It was therefore theoretically possible that via Mama, I might inherit the dukedom. Mama scraped and saved, sent me to the best school she could afford... In view of my present predicament, one little incident there occurs to me as amusing. Lionel Holland, which is the Sixth Commandment? Come, come now, surely you know what the Sixth Commandment is. Uh, uh, someone else then, Sabella. I know, please. Louis Mazzini, all right, tell me. Thou shalt not kill. Quite right, Louis, thou shalt not kill. Uh, no, in those days I never had any trouble with the Sixth Commandment. As for the seventh, I was hardly of an age to concern myself with it, although I was old enough to be in love. Sibella, for that was her name, and her brother were my only friends, and we grew up together. In their case, Mama relaxed her objection to my associating with local children. At least their father, Dr. Hallwood, was a professional man. But alas, those carefree school days soon passed, and when I was 17, Mama decided to have a serious talk with me. Now, Louis, the time has come to think very carefully about your future. Well, it should be quite easy to get a job. Not a job, dear. A career. Now, who do we know who could help us? Well, we don't know anyone. Except the family, and uh, they don't know us. The least we can do is to try once more. I shall write to Lord Ascoyne, Dascoyne. He can surely do something in that bank of his. Oh, bank, Mama? This is a private bank, Louis, dear. They don't pass money over the counter. The letter was duly dispatched, and this time we did get an answer. Madam, I'm instructed by Lord Ascon and Ascon to inform you that he's not aware of your son's existence as a member of the Ascon family. Signed by his secretary. It's very stupid of him, of them all, not to admit your existence, when one day you must be the Duke of Chalfont. But even potential dukes have to eat. Mr. Perkins, our lodger now for nearly 15 years, did his best to be helpful. Well, Louis, I've had another chat with Mr. Parsons, our manager. He says you can start any time you like. Uh, did he say anything about um, wages? Well, uh, times are hard, so in the circumstances, the firm don't feel they can offer you more than uh, 25 bob a week. Thus, the possible future Duke of Chalfont became what was known as a general draper's assistant. And this humiliation continued for two dispiriting years. And then, one day... Louis, Louis. Oh, Mr. Perkins, whatever's the matter? Louis, I, I have some bad news for you. Oh, my job? Your mother. She's had an accident. Ma? Uh, well, what happened? Uh, where? She's been knocked down by a tram at Clapham Junction. Oh, is she... Yes, uh, hurry, Louis, uh, hurry, hurry. Louis? Louis? Oh, where are you? I'm here, Mama. Louis? Yes, Mama? I... I should like to be buried at Chalfont in the family of all. You're not going to die, Mama. Promise me, Louis. Promise. Mama. Oh, Mama. 
Before leaving the hospital, I wrote to Ethelred, Duke of Chalfont, informing him of Mama's dying wish. His reply was the curtest possible refusal. Two days later, Mama was buried, and standing by her poor little grave in that hideous suburban cemetery, I made an oath that I would revenge the wrongs her family had done her. It was no more than a piece of youthful bravado, but it was one of those acorns on which great oaks are destined to grow. Oh, but there were other and more urgent problems, one of which was how to live on 25 shillings a week. Fortunately, this was solved for me by Sibella's father, the kindly Dr. Hallward. Louis, my boy, I've known your mother a long time, and if anything had happened to me or Mrs. Hallward, I know she'd have done the same. Oh, but I can't come and live here permanently. Why not? It's a big house. You can have your own room. Besides, you'll be company for Sibella. Hello, Father. Oh, my dear. Hello, Louis. I didn't know you were here. Well, I was having a talk with your father, Sibella. Louis is going to swallow his pride and come and live with us, Sibella. Oh, how nice he is. Well, I've got a surgery in five minutes. Goodbye, Louis. You can move in whenever you like. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, Sibella? Louis, I'm so glad you accepted. Oh, the certainty of seeing you every day was too tempting to be refused. I'll let you into a secret, Louis. It was my idea. It was? Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, who's that? I've got to go out. Oh, who is? Lionel Holland. Oh, you remember him. He's rather dull, but his father's very rich. See you later, Louis. The next few years brought many such heartaches, but they also brought promotion. I decided that if I was to be a draper, at least I would not be a suburban draper. So I migrated to a larger modern store which had just been opened in the West End at the gigantic salary of two pounds a week. There, each lunchtime, I went to the reading room at the public library to see how my inheritance was proceeding. Sometimes the death column brought good news. On April the 1st, peacefully at Chalfont Asylum, Cyril lit bitter desk on no flowers by request. <laughs> no, indeed. Sometimes the birth column brought bad news. The advent of twin sons to the Duke was a terrible blow. Fortunately, an epidemic of diphtheria restored the status quo almost immediately and even brought me a bonus in the shape of the Duchess who succumbed at the same time as her children. But the Duchy of Chalfont was not all absorbing. There were other matters to concern me of a more personal nature. That summer, a Hallward gave a party. Oh... Good evening, Sibella. Hello, Louis. You do look nice. So do you. Doesn't he, Lionel? Very. <clears throat> Sibella, may I have the pleasure of this dance? Oh, I'm awfully sorry, Lionel. I'm afraid I promised this one to Louis. Oh? Uh, you see, he didn't even know about it. Never mind, Lionel. You can have the supper dance with me if you like. Thank you. I seem to remember you promised the supper dance to me. Did I, Louis? I must have made a mistake. Well, that's the last of them, thank heaven. What an evening. I thought it was a very nice evening. No, it may have been for you. Oh, it's awful being a woman, having to dance with a lot of dull men. Laugh at their jokes while they're treading on your feet. I didn't tread on your feet. You're not dull, and your jokes are funny. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sibella. Mm -hmm. uh, Sibella, will you marry me? <laughs> Louis, of course not. And do get up on your knees like that. You, you may be half Italian, but even so, you do look silly. <laughs> Playing stage lover. Oh, I look silly, do I? Yes, very. <laughs> do I still look silly? No. Now will you marry me? No. Why not? Because I just said I'd marry Lionel. Oh, you can't. Why not? Well, he's a clod. He's not a gentleman. Listen, who's talking? Lionel will be very rich one day. I might be a duke one day. Pigs might fly. No, I might, really, I might. You see, Mama was the daughter of the seventh duke. Oh, yes, I know. Well, when you are a duke, you just come and show me your crown, or whatever it's called. And then I feel awfully silly, won't I? Oh, yes, you will. Oh, anyhow, I'm going to marry Lan, and now I'm going to bed. Good night, Louis. 
If there was a precise moment at which my insubstantial dreaming took on solid purpose, that was it. The dash coins had not only wronged my mother, they were the obstacle between me and all that I wanted. There were then some eight people between me and the dukedom, all seemingly equally out of reach. It is so difficult to make a neat job of killing people with whom one is not on friendly terms. I was almost resigned to its being an impossibility. When one afternoon, at a moment when my thoughts were furthest from the subject, fate took a hand. Uh, two and nine, three shillings. Five and five is ten, and ten is twenty. <laughs> Thank you very much, madam. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, sir. This young lady would like to see some petticoats. Uh, petticoats? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have a very nice line. Just come in. Uh, perhaps madame will care to look at this one. Thank you. Is it pure silk? Oh, yes, madame. Mm, you like it, Charles? Haven't you got anything more of? Uh, I'm afraid not, sir. Oh, all right. Well, a couple do, Priscilla. Mm, thank you, Charles. These London shops are so far behind Paris in this sort of thing. Mm. If you have nothing better, these will have to do. Parcel them up quickly and we'll take them with us. Charge them to my account. Yes, sir. Uh, what is the name? Mm. Mr. Ascoyne Dascoyne. At last, I was face to face with one of them. This was the son of Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne, the banker, whose refusal to help me toward a more dignified career had led to my present ignominious occupation. What right had this arrogant puppy to be standing on the other side of the counter ordering me about? In my excitement and anger, I listened openly to their conversation. I have booked rooms at Crookshanks at Maidenhead. I thought we'd go down late on Friday afternoon and stay till Monday. Are you sure it's safe? It's the most discreet place I know. Oh, you've been there before, then? <clears throat> no, of course not there. I, I mean... Hey, you! Get on with that parcel and never mind what we're talking about. Don't you dare talk to me like that. Do you think I'm interested in your idiotic conversation? If you want to add impertinence to your eavesdropping, we'll soon see about that. Send for the manager. The upshot was that I was dismissed on the spot. I decided to repay him in kind by dismissing him with equal suddenness from this world. His conversation had told me where I could probably find the opportunity to kill him, and Dr. Hallwood's dispensary could, I thought, provide me with a means. Arsenic, uh, laudanum, prussic acid, and all about this rat poison, eh? suitable, too difficult to administer. Uh, better stick to a proprietary van. I think arsenic. With the week's wages I had received in lieu of notice, I invested in suitable apparel for Maidenhead and booked a modest single room at Cookshanks. And that evening, after dinner, I took a stroll through the hotel in search of my quarry and found them having coffee and liqueurs together on the terrace. I decided to take the bull by the horns. Oh, well, forgive me. Uh, haven't we met before somewhere? I don't think so. Funny. I could have sworn I knew your face. Uh, we were at Monty last year. The year before. Ah, that must be it. Uh, won't you and your companion join me for a drink? Thank you. Not this evening. We're rather tired. Of course. I deprecated their retiring so early, but it was hard to blame them for weekends like life, a short. The next morning, I waited for them to come down. And the next afternoon. But they didn't appear the whole day, nor the morning after. I no longer felt sentimental. The weekend was nearly over, and I could hardly expect Providence to offer me so promising a chance again. When finally they did appear and made their way to the hotel boathouse, I was in a state of desperation. We'll take the punt. Very good, sir. Let's have some more cushions and an awning. Yes, sir. Ready, darling. Mmm. They drifted gently off downstream, and for a while I followed them on foot, hoping for I know not what. I had the poison with me, but they hadn't even taken a picnic basket. It was possible, however, that they might stop somewhere for refreshment. They did stop shortly afterwards, but uh, not for refreshment. And judging by past experience, they would be there for hours. I decided to hire a boat myself. I shouldn't take her down there if I were you, sir. Oh, uh, why not? Well, they open the weir gates at two o'clock. Oh, is that dangerous? Oh, yeah. There'll be one or two nasty accidents. People getting carried over the weir. Really? Oh, ah. You, you'll see a notice further down telling folks to more secure. Uh, do you get any warning? Oh, ah. 
They haul up a red flag and send the nuke. Thanks. I'll be careful. The rest followed automatically. I found the punt moored under some overhanging branches further up the reach. I tied up my canoe by the bank about 30 yards upstream and, pulling off my clothes, slipped over the side into the water. Fortunately, I'd learned to swim at the Clapham Municipal Bars, though I'd never had occasion to try it underwater. I decided to make for a point about five yards or so away from them, as I'd no wish to surface under their noses, though, judging by their rapt attention to each other, I doubt if they'd have noticed me even if I had. Darling. My positioning was perfect, and it took me about a second to untie the clumsy granny knot by which Mr. Ascoy and Ascoy had secured the punt to its pole. It was beautifully timed. Charles? Mm? We're moving. We're in heaven. But Charles, we're moving. We can't. We are. <gasps> My God, you're right. Jump, Charles. The way up. Jump for your life. I can't, Charles. I can't. Charles. <laughs> I was sorry for the girl, but found some relief in the reflection that she had presumably during the weekend already undergone a fate worse than death. I then conceived a brilliant idea. I would write a carefully phrased letter of condolence to old Ascard Dascoin. There would be an agreeable feeling of revenge for his cruelty to Mama. And further, it, it didn't fail to occur to me that there was at the moment a vacancy at the banking house. Lord Ascoin Dascoin duly rose to the bait. Lord Ascoin, Dascoin, we'll see you now, Mr. Mazzini. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mazzini, sir. Come in, Mr. Mazzini. How do you do? Uh, how do you do, sir? Uh, please be seated. Uh, thank you. That uh, photograph, isn't that... Mm, uh... It's my late son, yes. A great loss. He was young and foolish, but I believe had he been spared until his maturity... We it might... was my consciousness of that which led me to presume to tender you my sympathy. I am glad that you did so. A loss so tragic serves to put lesser matters in their proper perspective. If I remember, Mr. Uh, Mazzini, some years ago I received a communication from your mother. My late mother. Oh, yes, yes. It was, I believe, in connection with your career. Hello, Louis. You look very pleased with yourself. Oh, so do you, Isabella. <laughs> I have news. And so have I. Oh, what is it? No, you're so... Uh, Lionel and I have fixed a date for our wedding in two months' time. Oh, my congratulations. No, I should congratulate him. <laughs> I compliment you. Now your news. Oh, nothing so exciting as yours. I went today to see Lord Ascon Dascon, my cousin, you know... He had a private banking house in the city. He offered me employment at once at five pounds a week with excellent prospects of promotion. Louis, I'm so glad for you. Louis, Louis, do you remember? What? Once in this room after my party. I kissed you. Yes. And you were horrible to me. Yes, I made fun about you being related to the Das Coins. I'm sorry, Louis. You take it more seriously now? Oh, yes, Louis. Kiss me to show you've forgiven me. Uh, uh, no, it'll be wrong. Your pledge to Lionel. I behaved like a cad that night. I like you when you behave like a cad. The next candidate for removal seemed to be young Henry Descoyne, 24 years old, recently married, as yet without issue. I had quite an accumulation by now of Descoyne data culled from newspapers and periodicals, and I looked through it for a possible approach to Henry. Ah, as I soon found one, this interesting view of the picturesque village of Wimborne was taken by Mr. Henry Dascoyne, an enthusiastic photographer, who has contributed many a beautiful study to our pages. Ah, and I bought the necessary equipment, a second hand, and bicycled down there the following weekend. It seemed to me that I could find no better subject for my first essay in photography than the village inn, and it was through the viewfinder of my second-hand Portland Rogers that I first saw Henry Dascoin emerging from the saloon bar. He 
He watched me for a few moments, then came over. Uh, excuse me, uh, isn't that a portrait of Rogers? Yes. Uh, are you a photographer? Uh, Dabble in it, you know. Uh, got a Cobra Colt in myself. A Cobra Colt? Hmm. Nice little camera. A focal plane, shutter, rapid, rectilinear, and all that. Look here. Uh, why not come up to my house and I'll show it to you? I'd like you to meet the wife, too. Delightful. My name's Descoin, by the way. And uh, mine is Mazzini. How do you do? You don't do your developing and so on in the house, then? No. I've had one of the potting sheds fixed up in the dark room. Uh, come in and have a look. I say. Couldn't have suited better if it had been built for it. Had the equipment sent out from town. Now, I must say, the result would be absolutely top hole. There's everything to hand. Uh, uh, developing dishes here. Uh, toning bath here. A uh, whole plate in larger. Perfect. <laughs> Not too bad, is it? I'll show you some quarter plates I've taken of the village, if you like. Oh, uh, uh, talking of the village, by the by, I don't know if you're thinking of sending any of your efforts here to some periodical, uh, but there's uh, just one thing. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you're a good fellow. I wouldn't like to ask you. Ask what? I'd be most grateful if you'd keep back that last plate you exposed. At the inn? No, but it was delightful. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the fact is, my wife has uh, views about such places, so I never go in them. Uh, you understand? Oh, naturally. I wouldn't dream of embarrassing you. I knew you were a good fellow. Uh, suppose we have a drink on it. Unless you have views yourself, of course. Now, nah. splendid. Uh, but what should it be? Uh, sherry? Whiskey? In here? Well, it's uh, a bit difficult to... Uh, hide things up at the house, you understand? <laughs> so I've washed out some of these bottles and substituted something more interesting than, say, a developer or a fixer. Oh, well, in that case, I think a, a small developer, if I may. The mental picture of his wife that I formed from Henry's words left me unprepared for the charm of the woman I was to meet. She was as tall and slender as a lily, and as beautiful. I'm no photographer myself, Mr. Mazzini, but I share my husband's pleasure in welcoming a fellow enthusiast. You'll take some sherry? Well, uh, thank you, I, I... My husband and I never touch alcohol, but we see no reason on that account to enforce our views on our guests. Uh, I um, have some printing frames out in the sun. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just run out and see to them. Of course, Henry. Here you are, Mr. Mazzini. Thank you. <laughs> Have you been in the neighborhood long? Well, a few hours only. I was um, cycling through the village and felt compelled to stop and make a study or two of the inn. It looked so charming. It does look charming. But I'm afraid it's by no means an influence for good on the lives of the people here. Mrs. Descoyne was beautiful, but what a prig she was. I wondered how to ingratiate myself with her and decided to attack her on her own ground with her own weapons. I'm afraid we can offer you only a simple luncheon, Mr. Mazzini, but if you would care to stay, we should be pleased to welcome you at our table. You are most kind, but I feel I should not intrude. Oh, it is no intrusion. I'm afraid it is. May I explain? Please do. It was only when your husband told me his name that I realized that I'd come by chance into the most embarrassing situation. Oh? My mother was a member of the Dascoin family. She married as they thought beneath her, and from that day they refused to recognize her or my existence. I feel, therefore, that although in the circumstances you might hesitate to say so to my face, you and your husband will prefer not to receive me at your table. Perhaps you'll be good enough to explain matters to your husband for me. I shall naturally leave the neighborhood at once. Mr. Mazzini, please sit down. Oh, well... Uh... You have exhibited the most delicate feelings... I know nothing of the history to which you refer, but I have often felt that the attitude of my husband's family has failed to move with the times, that they think too much of the rights of the nobility and too little of its duties. The very honesty of your behavior would appear to me to prove them wrong. Was Lord Tennyson far from the mark when he wrote, Kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood? I hope you will stay to luncheon. Oh, in that case, I shall be delighted and honored. My impersonation of a man of striking character was such a resounding success that Mrs. Dascard invited me to spend the following Saturday to Monday with them. On the following Friday, I left London in the middle of the night and reached Henry's house just before dawn. 
Well, it took a mere five minutes to get into the potting shed and substitute petrol for paraffin in the darkroom lamp. Then I repaired to a meadow, took a few hours' sleep while awaiting the hour at which I could reasonably arrive at the house. Come in, my dear chap. How nice of you to come so early. Oh, not too early, I hope. <laughs> Of course not. Uh, did you bring that new lens with you? I did indeed. Splendid. Uh, now we don't want to waste a minute. And Mrs. Dashkow? Oh, Edith will be down presently. But the day dragged by in an agony of suspense for me. Henry took photograph after photograph, but seemed to have no urge whatever to follow it up with a visit to the dark room. I began to fear he'd suddenly taken the pledge. Uh, this is the last one. Uh, still? Uh, still like this? Oh, this, that's perfect. There. <sighs> I think that'll do. Uh, look, Edith, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just go and develop these before tea. Yes, dear. Uh, care to come, Mr. Mazzini? Well, I would indeed, but I have a slight headache. The sun, I think, and I'm afraid the chemicals wouldn't improve it. Mr. Mazzini and I will have tea under the tulip tree. I've always found that most beneficial for a headache. With milk, Mr. Mazzini? Uh, please. Mr. Mazzini? Yes? I hope you'll forgive my speaking to you on a personal matter, but it worries me that Henry should spend so much time on his hobby that he has little left for any more useful activity. Uh, he has uh, never shown any wish for a career in politics? None. Nor any other ambition? One only, to win a prize at the Salon of Photography in Brussels. <laughs> Can you smell something burning, Mr. Mazzini? Mm. Well, nothing except the exquisite fragrance of this tree, Mrs. Dashkow. Well, I can, most definitely. Well, I expect they're burning some leaves at the bottom of the garden. Oh, but they can't be at this time of year. Oh, look, the potting shed's on fire. Henry! No, you stay here. I'll go. Henry! 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 The funeral service was held in the village church at Chalfont prior to interment in the family vault. Mrs. Dashkow who had discerned in me a man of delicate sensibility and high purpose, asked me to accompany her on the cross-country journey to Chalfont. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. The occasion was interesting in that it provided me with my first sight of the Dascons en masse. Interesting but somewhat depressing, for it emphasized how far I'd yet to travel. There was the Duke, Ethelred, whose wife and twin sons had fortunately died of diphtheria. There was my employer, Lord Ascon Dascon. The service element consisted of Admiral Lord Horatio Dascon and General Lord Rufus Dascon. Next to him was Lady Agatha Dascon. Rufus! Oh, oh, oh. And in the pulpit, talking interminable nonsense, the Reverend Lord Henry Descoyne. And it is no exaggeration to say that the life cut short was one rich in achievement and, and promise of service to humanity. Amen. <coughs> The Daskan certainly appear to have accorded with the tradition of the landed gentry and sent the fool of the family into the church. Ah, oh, here's a carriage. Well, goodbye, Edith, my dear. Goodbye, Uncle Ethelred. No fretting now. After all, one thing to be said, we all have to come to it. Great thing in our family vault like ours. Constant reminder of one's heritage. So... Take this newfangled cremation nonsense. Who wants to see his nearest and dearest put in an incinerator? I think, sir, Mrs. Dascoin should leave. The wind is turning cold. As Mrs. Dascoin thinks best. Uh, glad we had Cousin Henry to take the service. Boring old ass, but he keeps the thing in the family. People get in strange ideas these days. Had a fellow write to me not so long ago, wanted to bury his mother here. From two ten or somewhere. Start letting strangers in, the place will be full up. No room for us, eh? <laughs> I privately promised him that I should make it my business to see there was room for him. Uncle Ethelred is not the most tactful of men. I could gladly have struck him. Oh, thank you for intervening when you did. 
Oh, the house will be so empty when I get back. And yet he will be in it everywhere. I find the thought of life there hard to face. Must you, Sarah? And you invite... No, I must. For one reason, if no other. They would say I was running away, that there was truth in all these rumors. Rumors? In the village, there's been gossip. Gossip? They say Henry drank in secret. They even say that that was the cause of the accident. Oh, I'm sure that Henry would never have professed one thing and practiced another. I, too, am sure. Otherwise, I think I could not survive. We have a long way to go. Try to sleep a little. Oh, sleep? does not come easily. Please try. I was conscious that a new obsession was about to join the one that I should wear the coronet of the Duke of Chalfont. It was that Edith Dascoigne should wear that of the Duchess beside me. And I resolved to embark upon her courtship as soon as a decent period of mourning should have elapsed. Sibella? Yes, Sibella was pretty enough in her suburban way... Indeed, there was no reason why we shouldn't continue to meet on friendly terms. But her face would have looked rather out of place under a coronet. A day or so later, my plans were materially advanced as the result of an unforeseen but highly agreeable conversation with my employer, Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne. Um, here's a list of bills due for redemption this week, Lord Ascoyne. Mm -hmm. I marked in red those asking for renewal. Yeah, thank you. Aitchison, yes. Pole and Carter, I suppose so. Knollis Limited, oh, no, no, no. Uh, Red Bank and Holland. You have a friend there, have you not? An acquaintance? Uh, I know Lionel Holland. Would you say that he's sound? Well, I wouldn't say that he was not sound. Oh, thank you. Let's uh, see, Yes, sir? Uh, I've watched your progress here with great care and have been gratified to note that it has fully justified my judgment in inviting you into the firm. In view of that, and in order that you may be able to adopt a style of living befitting a member of the Dascoyne family, I have decided to appoint you my private secretary at a salary of £500 per annum. I left the Hallwoods house and took a bachelor apartment in St. James's. Clapham no longer held Sibella's presence to compensate me for the tedious journey between the suburbs and the city. Anyhow, it was vastly more convenient for her to visit me in my new surroundings. Now, let me have a look at the beautiful Mrs. Holland. No, I think I prefer Miss Hallwood. So do I. Oh, Louis, it's very wrong of me to visit you here. Why? A married woman calling on a bachelor, a dangerous bachelor in his apartment. Why, dangerous? These things only become wrong when people know about them. This is a very discreet apartment. That's why I chose it. So that young women could call on you in safety? So that one young woman could? How did you know she'd want to? I hoped. <laughs> How do you enjoy your honeymoon? Not at all. Not at all? Oh, not at all. And how was it left? Oh, impossible. Every time I wanted to go shopping, Lionel dragged me off to a church or picture gallery. Louis, I think I've married the most boring man in London. In England? In Europe. Oh, the Italian men are so handsome. But I never could get away from Lionel for a moment. But I was forgetting. You're Italian. How? Oh. Louis, I can't speak frankly to you, can't I? Well, if not to me, to whom? I shall go mad. Already when he touches me, I want to scream. When you touch me, Louis, I want to purr. Oh, oh, what am I doing? You know very well. You're playing with fire. Well, at least it warms me. Oh, I must go. Lionel is dining at home tonight. And where is Lionel dining tomorrow night? With some business acquaintances. And where are you dining tomorrow night? Here. Here. Goodbye, Louis. Poor little imprisoned bird. Well, she was welcome to come and flutter her wings with me. I could think of many more disagreeable ways of killing time, pending the arrival of the moment when the conventional decencies would permit me to make my declaration to Edith. As to the other undertaking, I had not forgotten or forgiven the boredom of the sermon at young Henry's funeral, and I decided to promote the Reverend Lord Henry Dascoyne to next place on the list. I therefore assumed the garb and character of a colonial bishop, spending his vacation making a collection of brass rubbings from country churches. Good evening, my lord. Good evening, my lord. Uh, <coughs> good evening. 
I was just taking a rubbing of this most interesting brass. An ancestress of my dear late wife. Allow me to introduce myself. Henry Daskoyne, rector of this parish. Septimus Wilkinson, Bishop of Matty Beerland. How do you do? I'm spending my vacation taking a cycling tour around your beautiful country churches. Ah, have you noticed our clear story? Exquisite. The corbels are very fine. You will note that our chantry displays the crocketed and finialed ogies, which marks it as very early perpendicular. The, the bosses to the pendant are typical, and I always say that my west window has all the exuberance of Chaucer, without happily any of the concomitant crudities of his period. Mm -hmm. but, um, quite. Now we approach the fox. At last he did as I'd hoped and invited me to dinner. That will do, thank you, James. You can leave the full decanter on the sideboard with the cigars. The Reverend Lord Henry was not, I'm glad to say, one of those newfangled parsons who carry the principles of their vacation uncomfortably into private life. However, he exhibited a polite interest in the progress of the Christian faith in Matabele land, which I was at some difficulty to satisfy. Oh, interesting. Most interesting. Uh, do go on, my lord. Well, actually, the SPCK provided us with a large number of copies of the good book Translated into Matabele, but there's none of the natives can read even their own language. You uh, speak Matabele yourself? Not as a native. It, uh, it would be most interesting to hear a sample of the language. I, I'm afraid my Matabele is a little rusty. Oh, come, my lord. Um, uh, Daniel cast into the lion's den, for example. Excalabro, Daniele, Zamporo, Bishbara, Boo. Good gracious, if Daniel had been able to speak to the lions in that vein, assuredly his deliverance would have been as complete as that affected by his heavenly father. Well, that was a <laughs> colloquial rendering, of course. Most interesting. My lord, the port is with you. Oh, thank you. How did you find the wine? Ah, <clears throat> admirable. Rathbone 69. Oh, no finer year, in my view. My doctor, though, is of a different opinion. Man, what does he favor? Total abstinence, I regret to say. Oh, dear me, dear me. Would you care for a cigar? Thank you. Excuse me when I get you one. No, my doctor is continually warning me about the state of my arteries. But I say to him, what possible harm can there be in one glass of an evening? <laughs> or even two. <laughs> what harm indeed. You do not condemn me, then? Not in the least. Ah, my lord, I think you will find this cigar as admirable in its way as the Rathbone 69. Thank you. If I may say so, without disrespect to my superiors, your visit has brought me something which I could not expect from any churchman in this country. It had indeed. For the arsenic which I had purloined for young Henry and had not used was now dissolved in old Henry's fourth glass of wrath than 69. <coughs> I surmised, correctly as it proved, that Lord Henry's doctor would assume that he had succumbed to a surfeit of port and would politely ascribe death to a heart attack. On my return to London, I decided to proceed methodically with the elimination of the remaining minor obstacles. Lady Agatha Daskoyne was a pioneer in the campaign for women's suffrage. The trouble was, Lady Agatha's public appearances were invariably made under the watchful eyes of the Metropolitan Police. And when she was not making public appearances, she was in prison and still more inaccessible. In fact, before I could learn of a favorable opportunity, I had to join the movement myself. Secret plans had been made for Lady Agatha to celebrate her latest release from Holloway by sending in a balloon and dropping a shower of leaflets over Whitehall in the West End. On hearing of this, I had a brainwave. Well, not for nothing had I been an ardent toxophilite in my late teens. Yes. Sir? I want a bow and arrow. A bow and arrow, sir. Sir, 
Listen, Lisa. Perfectly composed, I waited by the open window of my apartment. My meteorological calculations proved correct. Borne steadily along on the prevailing southwest wind, Lady Agatha hove in sight. I took careful aim and fired. I shot an arrow in the air. She fell to earth in Barclay Square. Admiral Lord Horatio Dascoin presented a more difficult problem... He scarcely ever set foot ashore, and I was beginning to feel that this task was beyond even my ingenuity when he was conveniently involved in a naval disaster which arose from a combination of natural obstinacy and a certain confusion of mind, unfortunate in one of his rank. Full speed ahead. In this fog, sir. Full speed ahead, Captain. Good Admiral Destoy. Am I in command of this ship or are you, sir? I am, sir. Full speed ahead. Destroy on the port bow, sir. Bring her to port, Captain. Surely you mean starboard, sir. Port. <laughs> Both ships sank almost immediately, though fortunately all hands were saved, save one. Admiral Lord Horatio, obstinate to the last, insisted on going down with his ship. General Lord Rufus Dascoin, on the other hand, who never tired of demonstrating how he had fought the most calamitous campaign of the South African War, was a fairly easy proposition. It seemed appropriate that he who had lived amidst the cannon's roar should die explosively. I therefore concealed in a pot of caviar a simple but powerful homemade bomb, and through the post I sent the caviar to the general. Active service? Bah! You young Jefferson apes don't know the meaning of the word. Lolling about in clubs all day long? Oh, when I was a subble... Excuse me, my lord. This package has just arrived for you. Eh? What? Oh. Mm. Oh, fiddling wrappings. What? No. Oh, caviar. Oh, I wonder who sent that. Uh, good stuff. Used to get a lot of it in the Crimea. One thing the Ruskies do really well. No, no, no. What was I saying? When you were a subaltern, sir. Oh, by God, yes. Oh, we weren't wet nurse then, I can tell you. Stood me in good stead in the last war. I remember it's by and cop. The enemy concealed behind a small copse. Here. Uh, Twenty-four foot dug in um, here. Suddenly they charged. Downhill. Uh, but I held our guns fire until I could see the whites of their eyes. I assume this pot of caviar is the battery. And then I gave the order. Fire. believe there was a curse on our unfortunate family that seen it. Indeed, Lord Ascoyne, one could. I don't know if you realize how close this series of tragedies has brought you to the succession. I had not actually given the matter any thought, sir. Well, then it's time that you did. Do you not realize that you are heir presumptive to the dukedom? That is to say, in the event of the present duke, Ethelred, dying without issue, I alone intervene between you and the title. And I am an old man. I never really recovered from the first of these calamities. You mean that I might become Duke of Chalfont? I mean that you almost certainly will. And in view of that, I feel it would be more fitting that you should cease to be an employee here and become instead my partner. Yes? Mr. Lionel Holland is here to see you, sir. Oh, yes, sir. I'll show him in. Mr. Lionel Holland... Well, Louis, 
How are you? Well, to save time, I presume you've called to ask for the renewal of your bill. Yes. <clears throat> the fact is, old boy, we sell short, and the market hasn't dropped as we expected. I feel entitled to point out that we here in this bank regard our function as the encouragement of constructive investment and not the financing of mere gambling transactions. I know, old boy, but it's like this. At the it? same time, however, we are generally prepared to give a client a second chance. We will renew at three and a half percent. Three and a half percent? Isn't that a bit steep, old boy? It would have delighted me to refuse him. However, a bankrupt Lionel could hardly have continued to support Sibella in her extravagances, and I had no wish to do so myself. Especially as I judged that the time was now ripe to make a move in the matter of Edith Dascoin. Mrs. Dascoin, I'm going to say something presumptuous. Oh? You must order me from your house if you wish. It is this. If you should ever feel that the constant support of a devoted admirer would be of assistance to you, I should be most honored if you would permit me to offer you my hand in marriage. Mr. Mazzini, this is a shock. I'm most touched, most grateful, but I could not consider even the possibility of remarrying. Oh, I've spoken too boldly and too soon. Please regard what I've said merely as something to draw upon should you ever feel so inclined. Sibella was waiting for me when I got back. I was pleased to see her. For while I never admired Edith so much as when I was with Sibella, I never longed for Sibella as much as when I was with Edith. Oh, I'm afraid I'm late. Have you been bored? No. I've been looking into the fire and thinking. What about? Oh, how we used to roast chestnuts round the other fire. And what a lot has happened since. Let me get you a glass of wine. Thank you, Louis. The advantage of our association is that we see each other when we want to, and we're not obliged to see each other when we don't want to. We don't see each other as often as I'd like to. You've been away the whole weekend. I had to go. Where? Ah. I think you'll find this, my dear, uh, very much your taste. You haven't answered my question. Oh, uh, to see Mrs. Dascon, the widow of that cousin of mine who was killed. All your cousins seem to get killed. I really wouldn't be in the least surprised if you'd murdered them all yourself. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> come, John. Uh, Louis. Sorry. Uh, whatever made you say that? Oh, just silliness. Well... If you promise not to tell anyone, I'll let you into my guilty secret. I did murder them all. Hmm. I've suspected it for a long time. What she like? Who? Mrs. Dascoin. Oh, she's uh, tall, slender. Beautiful? Yes, I suppose some people would call her beautiful. Would you? I suppose so. I never really thought about it. What would you say if she asked you about me? I'd say you were the perfect combination of imperfection. I'd say that your nose was just a little too short, your mouth just a little too wide. But yours was a face that a man could see in his dreams for the whole of his life. Ah. I'd say that you were vain, selfish, cruel, deceitful. I'd say that you were adorable. I'd say that you were Sibella. What a pretty speech. I mean it. Come and say it to me again. Shortly afterwards, my employer had a stroke. There was little that could be done, and the doctor gave him a month of the most to live. I was glad, after all his kindness to me, that I should not have to kill the old man. Soon, the only obstacle between me and my inheritance would be Duke Ethelred himself. I could lay no plan for disposing of him, as the life he led within the great stone walls of Chalfon Castle was a closed book to me. I was gloomily examining the problem for the hundredth time... As I waited one day, the expected arrival of Sibella at my apartment. Oh, coming. Good afternoon, Mr. Mazzini. Mrs. Dascoy. I was passing through St. James's and thought I'd take the opportunity to call on you. Uh, well, what's that? Why? Is it uh, discreet, I mean? There are some conventions which must be governed by individual circumstances. Surely it is safe for a woman to visit a man of your reputation. Well, it is of your reputation that I'm thinking of. Uh -huh. Without being inhospitable, I would be happier if your visit were not a long one. Won't you come in? Thank you. I appreciate the scrupulousness of your motives. I have anyhow only one important matter to speak of. And that is? I have thought a great deal about what you said at our last meeting. And I've tried to think what Henry's wishes would be. I remember he said to me once, 
You have too much good in you, Edith, for one man. I sometimes wish that others could have a share of it. I have reconsidered the offer you made to me. Thank you again for it. And accept it, gladly. Oh, you robbed me of words. I think, however, we should make no announcement for three months at least. Uh, as you think best. Uh, do you not think, though, that perhaps Uncle Ethelred, as head of the family, should be told at once? Oh, perhaps so. Yes, I'll write to him. Goodbye, Louis. Goodbye, Edith. You leave behind you the happiest man in London. Well, this was not a piece of news that I was looking forward to breaking to Sibella. She had no rights in the matter, but women have a disconcerting ability to make scenes out of nothing, prove themselves injured when they themselves are at fault. A day or so later, I received a letter from Lionel. He requested an interview with me at his house on a matter of some delicacy. I was somewhat perturbed, for nine times out of ten, what is referred to as a matter of some delicacy is, in point of fact, one of extreme indelicacy. Two days later, therefore, I made the tedious journey to Bayswater... It was typical of Lionel that he should live on the wrong side of the park. Always admired the sporting way in which you took Sibella marrying me and not you. So I thought as you'd been keen on Sibella at one time, and you and I are old friends, I'd, I'd ask you to help me. Help you? Mm. I, I told you some time back, business hasn't been going too well. Since then, it's gone worse. I'm bankrupt. So I said to myself, why not talk to my old pal Louis Mazzini? who used to have such jolly times with round the old nursery fire roasting chestnuts. I'm afraid your memory is deceiving you. By no stretch of imagination could you and I be described as ever having been pals. Always thought of you as a pal. Always have done. Well, that's why I said to myself... It's only fair to warn you that any further expense of breath on this subject will be a waste of time. You know what you're doing? Condemning me to death. What do you mean? Only one way out for me. Do away with myself. If you knew how absurd these histrionics sound. I'm insured. At least the little woman will be provided for. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, Louis, I appeal to you. On my knees, I appeal to you. Not for my sake, but for the sake of the little woman. Please rise from that absurd position. All I can say is, I, I think you're a cad. A selfish cad. Let me remind you of a little not-so-ancient history. When I was a draper's assistant, and you, a rich father's son, you showed me no kindness. Now our positions are reversed, and you come whining to me for favours. <laughs> draper's assistant... That's right. Rotten little counter-jumper, that's all you are. You're very high and mighty now, but your mother married an Italian organ grinder. Get up out of that chair. Hmm? I said get up. Oh, oh. I will not tolerate hearing my mother's name on your coarse lips. Oh, so you want to fight? Well, whatever else Lionel Holland is, he's not a coward. Well, there seems no point in prolonging this vulgar brawl, and I refuse to demean myself by fighting with a drunken oath. Oh. 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 If you take my advice, you'll pick yourself up. Go put your head under a cold tap. Uh, who is it? It's me, Sibella. Oh, uh, well, I'm in the bath. Uh, is it important? Yes. Oh, all right. Um, just let me get my dressing gown. Oh, Louis. Oh, really, Sibella. You do chose the most unusual hours to visit a fellow. Well, you'd better come in. I'm sorry to worry you, but I have a piece of important news, bad news. I thought you ought to know at once. Lionel has found out about us, about me coming here. Really? Yes. Oh. I had the most dreadful scene with him last night. Mm, well, I suppose even Lionel isn't stupid enough to be deceived forever. Well, you won't take it so calmly when you hear. He's going to start divorce proceedings. How very unsophisticated of him. There's only one possible way out that I can see. And that is? Lionel is still in love with me. My happiness is all he cares about. He might do the gentlemanly thing and let me divorce him. Yes, uh... If I were in a position to explain to him that otherwise he would be jeopardizing the social position not only of the future Duke, but also of the future Duchess of Charles Sand. I see. You're a clever little thing, Sibella, but not quite clever enough. What do you mean? I mean that not only do I know that you're blackmailing me, oh. an ugly word, but the only appropriate one, but I also know that you're bluffing me. <gasps> it so happens that I was with Lionel less than an hour ago, and it was transparently clear from his demeanor and conversation that he hadn't the faintest suspicion that you and I had any relationship other than that of, well, as he would probably put it, old pals. Oh. <laughs> so while thanking you for the honor that you've done me, 
I must decline your offer because I have other arrangements which make it impossible for me to accept it. Namely? I'm shortly going to announce my engagement to Mrs. Daskoy. May I say that I think you've behaved despicably. Has it ever occurred to you, Sibella, that we serve each other right, you and I? Would it be asking too much of your manners to escort me to the door? I suspected that to confide the secret of my engagement to Mrs. Daskoy and to the Duke might be an adroit maneuver, and I was proved correct. For I produced an invitation for Edith and me to spend a few days at the castle. Mm. It was pleasant to stand on the battlements and know that the acres which stretched as far as the eye could see would soon be mine. I walked to the parapet and looked down. There was a sheer drop of some 150 feet into the moat below. And the thought crossed my mind that if I could inveigle his grace to the edge and shove in the small of the back, it might present me with the fate accompli I desired. Don't believe in going too near the edge myself. Haven't much of a head vibes. Oh. There isn't that lodge in the distance over there? Yeah, that's the advantage of this tower. See who's calling on you and be out to the undesirables. Oh, look, uh, there's a carriage coming up the drive now. Yeah, that'll be Lady Redpole and her daughter. Oh, I didn't know you were having a house party. Well, just an informal one. Know the Redpoles? Uh, no, I haven't had the pleasure. Let's go down and meet them. Lady Redpole, this is a cousin of mine, Mr. Louis Mazzini. How do you do, Lady Redpole? Oh, how do you do, Mr. Mazzini? Isn't that an Italian name? My father lived for many years in Italy. Such a charming country. I suppose you're not related to Mr. Garibaldi, the great patriot, in any way. Uh, in no way, Lady Redpole. My father was a singer. Really? I thought all Italians were related to each other. <laughs> I know they're all singers. Do you sing, Mr. Mazzini? I regret to say that I do not. Thank God for that. I beg your pardon. Uh, this is my daughter, Maud. Uh, How do you do? Can't stand all this singing nonsense. Went to the opera last time I was in London. Had to. Couldn't understand a word. Yeah, perhaps they were singing in Italian. Whatever it was, never heard such a hullabaloo in my life. Ah, dinner. Come on, Ethelred. You can take me in. I'm ravenous. Haven't fit for three hours. Oh. Doesn't do to miss the old brown mat, eh? Oh. Uh, Lady Redpole, allow me. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mazzini. I always say you Italians are so gallant. I thought if I watched Maud Redpole push another mouthful of food down her throat, I should be sick. But at length, dinner was over, and the ladies withdrew, leaving me alone with their red and the port. Try this. Rathbone 69. What? Rathbone 69. Family favourite, so to speak. Old Henry was inordinately fond of it. <laughs> so I believe. Oh, they say young Henry drank too, you know. Oh, surely not. Wouldn't say anything to his wife, of course. Ah, beautiful woman, Edith. Ah, uh, you're a lucky fellow, Messini. I never cease to be conscious of that. <laughs> Suppose I ought to call you Louie now that you're one of the family. <laughs> Have a nut. Thank you. What do you think of Maud? Oh, oh a, a charming girl, though. <laughs> Perhaps at the times her conversation is a little um, lacking in sparkle. Most boring woman I've ever met. Only got two interests in life, a stomach and a horse's. Plain, too. But good breeding stock. Yes, good breeding stock, the Red Poles. And they litter a very high proportion of boys. Do I gather you mean uh, that? Uh, uh, spoke to old lady Red Pole this afternoon. <laughs> Only too glad to get the girl off her hands. My congratulations. Well, duty to the family, really. When does the um, union take place? Very soon. I'm not growing any younger. Mightn't get a son first time, either. Have another nut. One thing was clear. If I did not succeed in disposing of the Duke during this present visit to the castle, I was likely to see the ruin of my whole campaign. Next morning, I went out shooting with him. Or rather, to watch Ethelred shooting, for my principles will not allow me to take a direct part in blood sports. Oh, that's all right. Fire cat. What do you think of that, Louis? Remarkable. Uh, Morning, Your Grace. Been round the traps this morning, Hoskins. Not yet, Your Grace. Oh, don't go that way, sir. Oh, why? Uh, I've got a trap set there, sir. Oh, uh, good heavens, so you have it. I shouldn't like to get caught in that. 
What's it for? We're losing so much game lately. Had to start setting the man traps again. Place is tipped with poachers. Will they catch any of this way? Caught one yesterday. What'd you do with them? Charge them? No. Hoskins thrashes them, lets them go. They don't poach on my land again, I can tell you. All right, Hoskins, keep moving the traps around or the blighters will tell each other where they are. Yes, Your Grace. Oh, getting on for lunchtime. Shall we go back? Oh, my audience... I thought man traps were illegal. They are. What happens if one of the poachers tells the police? Comes up before the bench for poaching, gets six months in jail. If he keeps his mouth shut, he just gets a hide in on a few days in bed with a lacerated leg. Which would you choose? Ah, I see what you mean. Only way to deal with these ruffians, I saw you. Uh, oh, lost something? Mm, my cigarette case. I must have dropped it back there when we were talking to Hoskins. If you go on, I'll catch you up. Can you manage that thing by yourself, Hoskins? Yes, thank you, sir. Where are you putting it? By this here elm tree, sir. I've got a notion these ruffians come up the gully here. Are uh, you looking for anything, sir? No, no, it's all right. I thought I'd lost my cigarette case. Find it? Yes, thanks. Oh, I might have another walk around this afternoon if you feel like it. Oh, that would be most pleasant. So after luncheon, we went out to massacre a few more unfortunate birds. Plastic birds! They seem to get up rather quickly, didn't they? What do you mean? What? What is it? It's over there. Huh? I thought I heard something. Someone moving through the bracket. Another poaching ruffian! Come on! Uh, by the gully. Blow if I can say anything. Well, he, he may be lying doggo. Uh, but try a bit further to your left. Oh! Yes, yeah, yeah, by the tree. I certainly came from there. Come out of it, you confounded ruffian! Oh! Oh! oh blast it! What happened? Oh, one of these blasted traps. Oh, Hoskins must have moved them round. Oh, Louis, get me out of this! Hurry up, man! Be quiet, oh, man. Uh, I want to talk to you for a minute. What's the matter? Don't point that gun at me, man. Have you gone mad? No, but if you make so much noise, I shall blow your head off. Well, By the time anyone has heard the shot, I shall be running back toward the castle, shouting for help. I shall say that you uh, stepped on the trap, and your gun went off accidentally as it fell. Blow off your head! Be quiet. To spare you as much pain as possible, I'll be brief. When I've finished, I shall kill you. You'll be the sixth Dascoin that I've killed. What? You want to know why? In return for what the Dascoins did to my mother, you yourself refused to grant her dying wish, which was to be buried at Chelfont. And when I saw her poor little coffin slide underground, saw her exiled in death as she had been in life, I swore to have my revenge on your intolerable pride. Oh, that revenge I am just about to complete. I clear the door and say, give me that gun at once. No. From here, I think the wound should look consistent with the story I shall tell. No! And so Ethelred, eighth Duke of Chalfont, duly came to his place in the family vault. There were few Dascoins left to mourn him. And my employer, the banker, who was the ninth Duke of Chalfont for the shortest possible period, having expired of shock on hearing that he had succeeded to the title. And so I became the tenth Duke of Chalfont. And one evening, a few weeks later, an affecting little feudal ceremony took place to welcome me into residence at the castle. And I promise you that my first consideration, and that of Mrs. Dascoyne, who has done me the honor to consent to be my wife, will be the welfare of the estate and of the people who live on it. God bless you all. Well, Hoskins, I think everything went off quite satisfactorily. Thank you, Your Grace. Oh, there uh, is one thing, Your Grace. Uh, oh, yes? Some of the older tenants on the Chalfont estates are waiting to meet Your Grace in the Great Hall. Oh, of course, sir. This is custom, I believe. Uh, yes, Your Grace. Well, you'd better come with me, Hoskins, and tell me who they all are. Certainly, Your Grace. The Sprocket Farm lot, Your Grace. Oh, uh, thank you, Hoskins. 
Good evening. Oh, Pennyman, your grace, from, from Sprocket's Farm. Uh, Mrs. Pennyman. How do you do? My son, Tom. Uh, do you work at Sprocket's Farm, Tom? Yes, your grace. Oh, he's a good lad, your grace. Uh, Mr. Wyville, your grace, chief herdsman at Sprocket's Farm. I've heard of you, Mr. Wyville. <laughs> Thank you, your grace. Uh, Mr. Uh, Burgoyne. Uh, uh, from Sprocket's Farm? Uh, no, your grace. Uh, from Scotland Yard. Uh, Scotland Yard? A matter of some delicacy. You are, I take it, his grace, the Duke of Chalfont? Um, I am. I am Detective Inspector Burgoyne of the Criminal Investigation Department, and I hold a warrant for your arrest on the charge of murder. Murder? Of murdering Mr. Lionel Holland. Murdering uh, whom? Mr. Lionel Holland, at number 242 Connaught Square, Bayswater, on the 17th of October last. Utterly bewildered, I tried to fathom what series of events could conceivably have led to this not very amusing irony. I could only suppose that Lionel had actually carried out that drunken threat of suicide. But how, then, had the blame fallen on me? Hmm, time alone and the trial would reveal the answer. Seeing no reason to forego any of the available privileges of my rank, I exercise my rights to be tried before the House of Lords. Louis Gascoigne Mazzini, Duke of Chalfont, you as a peer of England are indicted for murder. How say you, Your Grace? Are you guilty of the felony with which you are charged or not guilty? Not guilty. How will you be tried? By God and my peers. God send Your Grace a good deliverance. That the evidence I shall give before this court shall be the truth. The whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Um, uh, Mrs. Holland, will you tell their lordships in your own words the substance of the conversation you had with your husband the evening before his death? He told me that Louis, uh, the prisoner, was coming to see him the next day on a rather delicate matter. Uh, did he indicate what the matter was? He had discovered that the prisoner and I had been... Had been on terms of intimacy? Yes. And what was his attitude? He felt that the correct thing to do was to tell him to his face that he intended to start proceedings for divorce. Hmm. Uh, from your knowledge of the prisoner, how would you expect him to receive that news? I should expect him to be very angry. Now he was heir to a dukedom. He had no more use for me. I see. He was trying to discard you. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Holland, I apologize for submitting you to this ordeal, but will you tell their lordships how you found your husband's body? I came back about half past four. I went into my husband's study. He was lying on the floor with a dagger stuck in his chest. One last question, Mrs. Holland. Had your husband ever at any time threatened suicide? Never. Thank you, Mrs. Holland. My client craves their lordship's permission to cross-examine the witness himself. Their lordship grant their permission. Thank you. Mrs. Holland, you understand the meaning of being on oath? Of course. You realize that a life may depend upon the truthfulness of your evidence? Yes. I put it to you that your story of your conversation with your husband on the night before his death is a complete fabrication. It is not. I put it to you that your husband committed suicide. He would never have done that without leaving a message for me. Can you swear that he did not? The police searched the room very thoroughly. They didn't find anything. I suggest that your evidence is a tissue of lies dictated by motives of revenge. It is not. Oh, it is not. I presume that the prisoner has some purpose in these submissions other than that of distressing the witness. My purpose, my lord, is to determine the truth. Well, that, your grace, is the whole purpose of this assembly. Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. You are Edith Bascoigne Mazzini, Duchess of Chalfont? I am. When and where did you become the wife of the accused? Yesterday morning, in Pentonville Prison. I wanted to publish irrevocably before the whole world my faith in his innocence. I wanted to show by my marriage that though he was led astray, as I believe, by that innate kindliness and courtesy of his, which made it so hard for him to rebuff the advances of a woman. I nevertheless regard him as a man to whom I can happily entrust the remainder of my life. 
my late husband and other members of the Das Coyne family, unfortunately unable to testify today, would I know have echoed every word that I have said. Thank you, Your Grace. It does counsel for the prosecution wish to cross-examine the witness. Uh, no, my lord. The witness may stand down. Court is adjourned for one hour. <laughs> Now, Your Grace, the deceased was a client of the banking house of which you are chairman and managing director. He was. In the normal course of business transactions, he would have come to see you at your office. Yes. Instead of which, he asked you to go to his house. Yes. He invited you to his house to discuss business. And you asked their lordships to believe that? Yes. In the course of this um, business discussion, he burst into tears fell on his knees and threatened suicide. Uh, yes. Is that usual in business discussion? Uh, not usual, no. But it happened on this occasion? Yes. And you ask their lordship to believe that? Yes. Then this um, business discussion became so heated that blows were exchanged and he made a murderous attack upon you? Yes. Is that usual in business discussion? No. But it happened on this occasion? Yes. And you ask their lordship to believe that? Yes. Very well. Uh, you've heard of cases of a jealous husband and his wife's lover coming to blows? Yes. Frequently? It is one of the clichés of the cheaper kind of fiction. I put it to you that in this case, it happened not in fiction, but in fact. I put it to you that it did not. I put it to you further that being unaware at that time of your future wife's forgiving nature, you assumed that if you were cited in a divorce suit, it would ruin your chances of making this advantageous match with a wealthy and beautiful woman. No, not at all. Still, you were proposing to discard Mrs. Holland. No. I, I mean, uh, no. Even though you were about to be married to the other lady. Uh, thank you, Your Grace. That is all. Oh, my lord, having justly considered your verdict, the question for Your Lordship is this. Is the prisoner guilty of the felony whereof he stands indicted, or not guilty? <coughs> guilty upon my honor. Guilty upon my honor. Guilty upon my honor. Guilty upon my honor. Thus was I, Louis Dascoigne Mazzini, 10th Duke of Chalfont, unjustly condemned for a murder I did not commit. Uh, you have a visitor, Your Grace. My wife? Uh, no, Your Grace. Uh, Mrs. Holland. Louis. Sibella. Louis, I was thinking that question you asked at the trial about Lionel leaving a suicide note. Suppose he did. Suppose that one were found even now, this last evening. It would save her of a miracle. Miracles can happen. Miracles could happen. A note might be found. I see. It's strange, isn't it, how things turn out? Now, if you had married me instead of Edith... Oh, you would marry me instead of Lionel? He would still be alive. And you wouldn't be going to be hanged tomorrow morning. Unless, of course, you'd murdered somebody else. All of which is rather beside the point, isn't it? Is it? Do you remember in the old days how we used to play Eeny, meeny, miny, mo? A catch a nigger by his toe. If he hollers, let him go. Out goes he. Quite a lot of little niggers have gone out, haven't they, one way and another? And every one of them are Dascoyne. Mm, we do seem to be a very short-lived family, I must admit. Of course, Edith is only a Dascoyne by marriage, so I suppose... Her prospects of a long life are better. Uh, perhaps. Except for a miracle. Like the other one we were talking about. So now we have two miracles in mind, do we? Lionel's note and Edith's early demise. Yes. I wonder if they are in any way dependent on each other. Well, they might be. What do you think? Time's up, Your Grace. What do you think? Poor Edith. I'm afraid all this is going to take years off her life. Do you think so? I'm almost certain of it. Au revoir, Louis. Au revoir, Sibella. So there it was. She would find the note if I, in return, would murder Edith. What could I do but accept? But the night has gone by and nothing has happened. It is now but a few minutes to eight. 
signed under my hand. This 8th day of August, 1902, Louis Dascoigne Mazzini, Duke of Chalfont. I am afraid so. If you have any last instructions... I think, Colonel, it only remains to thank you for your many kindnesses. Oh, your grace. <coughs> oh, won't you introduce our friend? Uh, Mr. Elliot, his grace, the Duke of Charlton. Uh, good morning, your grace. Uh, this won't take a moment, but uh, first, if your grace will pardon the liberty, I should like to read some verses composed by myself for use on these melancholy occasions. Uh, your grace permits... With pleasure... Well, as you see by this pile of manuscripts here, I too have not been idle. Oh, a fellow artist, Your Grace. <clears throat> My friend reflect... Uh, oh, pardon me. Uh, your Grace reflect while yet of mortal breath some span, however short is left to thee, how brief the total span twixt birth and death, how long thy coming tenure of eternity. Uh, oh, thank you. Your Grace, prepare. Colonel, Colonel. What does this mean? This letter has just come from Whitehall, sir. The messenger said it was to be delivered to you immediately. Excuse me. Thank God. Your Grace, this letter is from the Home Office. Apparently a note has been found, undoubtedly in Mr. Holland's handwriting, expressing his intention to commit suicide. It is a miracle. Yes, it is like a miracle. Pending receipt of further instructions, I'll try to make you reasonably comfortable in my quarters. I imagine you won't be sorry to leave here. It is a trifle austere. Goodbye, Mr. Ellis. I'm sorry our acquaintance was so shortly. Good morning, Your Grace. Good morning. I'm gratified to think that the Home Office lost no time in ordering your immediate release. Well, the only thing is, Colonel... I hope this unexpected turn of events didn't prove too unsettling for On the contrary, Your Grace, I can assure you that I have never been more happy to be relieved of an official duty. Oh, poor Elliot. If you hadn't insisted on reading that abominable poem, you'd have had me neatly dangling at the end of his rope before the news arrived. Undoubtedly, yes. He was so looking forward to it. Well, here we are. Well, I understand, Your Grace, from the men on duty outside that a large crowd awaits your leaving. Having robbed them of the pleasure of my death, the least I can do is to let them see me alive. Including not only Her Grace the Duchess, but also Mrs. Holland. Uh, oh, I see. Well, goodbye, Colonel. Uh, goodbye, Your Grace. All right, Water. Open the gate. There were two carriages waiting for me outside the gates. In one sat Edith, erect, beautiful, aristocratic. In the other, Sibella, purring with satisfaction, and I... How did the song go? How happy could I be with Alba, where t'other dear charmer away? Well, I could decide later which of these two little niggers would finally have to go. Dear Edith, or captivating Sibella... Excuse me, Your Grace. Yes? I represent the magazine Chit Chat, by whom I'm commissioned to approach you for the publication rights of your memoirs. My memoirs? Oh, my memoirs. The brief history of the events leading there to written on the eve of his execution by Louis de Scoyne Mazzini, 10th Duke of Chalfont, who ventures to hope that this confession of his guilt might prove not uninteresting to those who remain to read it. Well, my memoirs. Uh, yes, Your Grace, your memoirs. Oh, my God. My memoirs. Kind Hearts and Coronets was adapted for radio by Gilbert Travers Thomas from the screenplay by Robert Hamer and John Dighton. The part of Louis was played by Gwyneth Price. Sibella by Jane Wenham. Edith by Diana Olson. Members of the Gascoigne family, 
Ethelred, 8th Duke of Chalfont, David March, Lord Ascoyne, Edward Chapman, the Reverend Lord Henry, Wilfred Carter, Admiral Lord Horatio, Hector Ross, General Lord Rufus, Hanlin Benson, Lady Agatha, Margaret Wolfett, Charles, Nigel Graham, and Henry Fraser Carr. Mr. Elliot was played by Gordon Faith, the prison governor, John Boxer, warder, Leonard Woodrow, Mrs. Mazzini, Eva Stewart, Mr. Perkins, Alan Haynes, Lionel Holland, Gordon Gardner, Priscilla, Rosalind Shanks, Boatman, Timothy Harley, Hoskins, Kenneth McClellan, and Crown Counsel, Noel Howlett. The play which was recorded was produced by David H. Godfrey. <laughs>